I'll be discussing the approach to management of refractory autoimmune hepatitis and PBC. I'll review second and third line treatment options for refractory disease and introduce evolving treatment options. First, I would like to share a case about a 24-year-old female who originally presented to the hospital with jaundice and fatigue. Uh, there were no reported fevers, mental status changes, abdominal pain, rash, or joint pain, no reported alcohol usage, uh, no medications, over-the-counters, or supplement use. Uh, labs upon admission were notable for an AST of over 700, ALT over 1,000, uh, alkaline phosphatase over 500, bilirubin of, in the sevens, INR of 1.3. Patient underwent a diagnostic workup that was negative for viral hepatitis. Utox was negative. EBV and CM CMV uh, uh, PCRs eventually came back negative. Um, and then ultimately underwent a serological workup that was notable for an elevated ANA, smooth muscle antibody, uh, positive, an uh, positive AMA, and elevated IgG. Imaging, including MRCP, did not reveal any PSC or lymphoproliferative process. Given overall suspicion for autoimmune hepatitis, the patient underwent a liver biopsy, which demonstrated in inflammatory cell infiltrates with lymphocytes, uh, scatter neutrophils, rare eosinophils, and rare plasma cells. There was also interface hepatitis uh, present. Uh, there was hep hepatocyte rosetting, um, which is when hepatocytes arrange around a central lumen during the regenerative process uh, to a necroinflammatory change. And there was large amounts of necrosis uh, with hepatocyte dropout. The constellation of clinical presentation, serologies, pathology, and exclusion of other causes made autoimmune hepatitis plus or minus PBC in the context of serologies very likely. The patient was started on prednisone 60 with close monitoring of liver tests as an outpatient, and given the positive AME, uh, was started on ursodial given very low risk, although there's also the possibility to have started that later as well. After about three to four months, liver tests had normalized and azathioprine was initiated. Um, but after about two weeks, the AST and ALT started increasing slightly. And since prednisone had not yet been tapered, medication effect with azathioprine um, was thought to be a more likely etiology rather than an autoimmune flare. Azathioprine was discontinued and liver tests again improved over a few weeks. Uh, prednisone was ultimately tapered slowly over several months, but because the patient had started to develop mood changes, including irritability and moon facies, it was imperative that we now switch gears to a maintenance therapy. The patient was able to taper down to prednisone 5 without flare, at which time we decided to initiate mycophenolate mofetol after counseling on family planning and contraceptions and liver, uh, contraceptive use, and now liver tests remain uh, normal to date. So today I'd like to discuss the natural history and management of refractory autoimmune hepatitis and PBC, although I will gear um, the talk primarily to autoimmune hepatitis components since this tends to pose the greatest management challenges. Um, when encountering a challenging case, I always go back and scrutinize whether I have the right diagnosis, ensure that there are not any confounding variables like medications and supplements, which are quite pervasive, and confirm medication compliance, certainly. It's also really important to screen for celiac and thyroid disease and assess the relevance of other concurrent um, extrahepatic autoimmune conditions, as these can contribute to systemic inflammation and confound the liver tests. And in cases where the liver tests are perhaps not as pronounced as this case, but still not responding to treatment, it may be appropriate to evaluate for maybe um, uh, alcohol usage that wasn't endorsed or even concurrent metabolic associated diseases. Concurrent hepatic steatosis can occur in almost 30% of cases and may be, a rele may be relevant for patients who have been maintained on protracted steroid courses. Um, it is worth noting, however, uh, defining refractory, as, in many as it does come in many different shades. Um, certainly, there is worsening um, laboratory or histological findings despite compliance with standard therapy, which can be seen in treatment failure. 
Uh, there's, this is associated with the increased risk of progression to cirrhosis and liver failure and mortality rates of up to 30%. Uh, incomplete response, which can occur in close to 15% of adults. Um, and this is uh, where there's improvement of laboratory and histological findings, but it's insufficient to satisfy the criteria for remission. Uh, relapse, uh, where there's exacerbation of disease activity after induction of remission and drug withdrawal or non-adherence. And then certainly um, treatment intolerance, which occurs in about 10 to 13% of patients and is the inability to maintain maintenance therapy due to drug-related side effects. Um, with the goal uh, of treatment being biochemical and histological remission, steroids and azathioprine remain a first-line therapy are successful in the majority of cases. Two-thirds of patients receive corticosteroid therapy experience significant side effects. As many as 25% of patients on azathioprine develop side effects, and 10 to 20% of patients encounter treatment failure or insufficient response to treatment. Guideline on treatments are very limited because most of the data is based on retrospective studies, um, often on pediatric populations, very few randomized control trials, um, and a wide variability in clinical practices. But certainly, patients who have refractory disease have the highest probability of de developing long-term complications, such as decompensated cirrhosis and need for liver transplant. While these kinds of depictions are always intimidating, it is thought that a multi-step model of the immunopathogenesis of autoimmune hepatitis includes a break in self-tolerance to hepatocyte autoantigens, which initiates an immunological response causing progression of hepatic uh, ne necroinflammation and fibrogenesis. So this begins with a thymic autoantigen specific Treg, um, which is incapable of preventing the immune response to hepatic autoantigens during hepatic or systemic immune triggers. This leads to an antigen presenting cell, which presents autoantigenic peptides to T cell receptors on T cells and APCs. This leads to a cascade of proliferation and cytokine response, as well as hepatic injury. Um, necroinflammation destruction of hepatocytes results in activation of periportal stellate cells, which amplifies uh, this immune response and causes fibrosis in the absence of an effective immune suppression regimen. And as such, there are multiple areas where this ca cascade may not align perfectly to refractory disease, but there are, may also be opportunities to approach from different angles for future therapies. Mycophenolate uh, mofetolar MMF inhibits de novo purine biosynthesis to inhibit T and B cell proliferation. It's typically introduced as a second line treatment option. There is some limited data for the use of MMF plus steroids uh, with comparable results compared to azathioprine and steroids, but insufficient data to advocate for use of MMF alone as a first line agent. Patients who have a good response to azathioprine but have intolerance because of side effects tend to have improved response rates to MMF over those with azathioprine treatment failure, primarily because MMF has a generally slightly better, well-tolerated side effect profile. Predictors of a favorable response tend to include older age, lower levels of IgG, and INR. In a meta-analysis involving 12 studies comprising of 397 patients, pooled response rates for use of MMF as a second-line therapy for autoimmune hepatitis was around 0.58. And in the subgroup of five studies, pooled specific response rates with use of MMF due to intolerance to standard therapy was 0.82. And pooled response rates among non-responders to standard therapy was 0.32. So overall response rate of MMF as a second-line therapy in autoimmune hepatitis was high, and response rate was greater in patients who started the medication due to intolerance to standard therapy as opposed to non-responders. Tacrolimus suppresses IL-2 synthesis and T cell proliferation. It has been applied in combination with prednisone, budesonide, azathioprine, and or MMF. Its major side effects include metabolic syndrome and neurological symptoms. A multi-center study of patients examined either azathioprine intolerance or incomplete response or treatment failure 
Group one had a complete response to standard therapy, but were switched to second line therapy because of side effects to steroids or azathioprine. And group two patients had no response to standard therapy. There was no significant difference in the proportion of patients with a complete response to MMF versus tacrolimus. In group one, MMF and tacrolimus uh, maintained a biochemical remission of 91.9% and 94.1% of patients, respectively. Um, and then more group two patients, uh, given tacrolimus compared with MMF, had a complete response of about 56.5% versus 34%, respectively. When comparing versus MMF and tacrolimus, however, there are very few qualified studies. Uh, there are heterogeneous test results between studies and low quality of evidence to assess differences in frequency of biochemical uh, remission, mortality, or need for liver transplant. So MMF may be considered over tacrolimus in terms of side effect profile, but this is a conditional recommendation. The role of TNF inhibitors has been examined in patients with autoimmune hepatitis and IBD, but the heterogeneity of the population and its principal goal uh, for treating IBD has precluded conclusions about their role in autoimmune hepatitis. The weak evidence on efficacy and the increased risk of infection, especially in patients with cirrhosis, does not justify their usage as a second-line treatment uh, option at this time. Um, in terms of anti-B cell therapy, there is evidence that B cell depleting antibodies is limited to case series and does, does not justify their usage as second line treatments at this time. A prospective randomized control tri trial is ongoing, however, in um, ionilumab uh, in patients with autoimmune hepatitis who are non-responders or who are intolerant to glucocorticosteroids and azathioprine. Uh, the B-cell activating factor, BAF, is a cytokine um, in the tumor response factor family expressed by T lymphocytes and needed for B-cell development, differentiation, and survival. It has been implemented in treatment of other autoimmune diseases, including lupus. Uh, BAF levels have been associated with increased liver inflammation. It has been proposed as a third-line treatment option add-on uh, who did not respond to conventional therapy. Data is limited to small case series at this time. Uh, an example of one of the case reports within this case series includes a patient with lupus and autoimmune hepatitis. Treatment had previously included prednisone and azathioprine, which was continued for 12 months, but only achieved partial response and increase in liver tests whenever steroids were tapered down. Uh, belimumab was introduced at month 66 at, with IV at day 0, 14, 28, and every 28 days thereafter. Remission was achieved after first infusion and maintained for six months. There was a slight increase in the liver test, so steroids were again increased. Um, the belimumab duration was shortened and liver tests again improved. There was observed improvement in elastography and biopsy findings. Patient is maintained now on prednisolone and MMF, so this acts more as like a salvage induction, not a maintenance therapy at this time. For your reference, these are tables summarizing mechanisms of actions of the agents I've discussed, as well as major side effects highlighting MMF with leukopenia, diarrhea, and teratogenicity, and the CNI is primarily with metabolic risk factors or metabolic side effects. When considering overlap disease, it's important to remember that there may be actually a spectrum of clinical manifestations uh, with imprecise boundaries and overlapping features between the conditions. Management um, with either, uh, this can be directed towards the predominant manifestation versus cholestatic phenotype or combined therapy. This is a conditional recommendation with low quality of evidence. Ursodial immunosuppressants or a combination of both have been used, but evidence supporting one regimen over another is very sparse. The heterogeneity of the disease may impact consistent identification of the disease and management strategies within the literature. In cases of severe autoimmune hepatitis uh, on an aside that is not presenting as liver failure, if it doesn't respond to steroid therapy within two weeks, it's important to consider liver transplant evaluation if not already in process. 
um, pharmacological and biochemical agents that can restore homeostatic mechanisms that modulate immune responses, reduce oxidative stressors, or inhibit hepatic fibrosis will be a goal to supplement or replace current treatments. Due to a limited quality of data, consensus recommendations for management of refractory disease are conditional with low certainty for use of MMF or tacrolimus to achieve and maintain biochemical remission. Due to side effect profile, trial of MMF over tacrolimus as the initial second line agent in refractory autoimmune hepatitis may be very reasonable. Given conditional recommendations, there may be liberty to apply an individualized approach um, and then there's evolving treatment options may impact uh, B and T cell targets as well as a variety of pathways. Thank you so much for your time.